So much of the leadership doesn't know what it's like to work on these games anymore. They don't understand the time and effort that it takes to go into because they've either never worked on games like that before or they just, you know, don't care. With these large companies, you know, you kind of just have to do what they say, right? And we've learned over the years that they're going to do the legal minimum required instead of the ethical maximum. My role in the gaming industry is under quality assurance. Quality assurance testers are the folks who actually work with the game software day by day to make sure that there's not issues or glitches. It's our job to find issues, report them so they can get fixed, and so that the game can go out looking and feeling as best as it possibly can. I started at Activision as a QA tester, and my experience there was horrible. I worked on Black Ops 3, I was night shift. I remember the lights would turn off after 9 p.m. and then we would get like yelled at for spilling creamer. We would work 14 hour shifts at one point trying to get Black Ops 3 out. It was just insane. Like it felt like a dungeon. Especially when I was working in VR games. As a QA tester, you would be in the headset anywhere from four to eight hours a day with essentially two small TV screens blaring into your eyes. It's worth noting that VR manufacturers actually suggest players only stick to like 30 to 60 minutes a day. I personally have long-term you know, eye vision damage from that experience. I know other people too who had chronic motion sickness for a long time even after quitting their job. The treatment of QA across the board, across the game industry is like a really huge ongoing problem. I think that a lot of companies bank on, you know, you get your dream job, you're working in video games, so they pay you low wages. Um, they tell you that overtime isn't mandatory, but if you don't do the overtime, you're not called back. We had been frustrated about pay for a long time. We had several testers who weren't food stamps. Like, we had people who were qualifying for, for SNAP. It was, you know, frustrating to know that we were putting out this game that makes upwards of $5 million a day and couldn't see any of that return. And in these places like, you know, Irvine, where Blizzard is, and Los Angeles, and really expensive cities, quality assurance testers need to have like three roommates to survive. And it's not even that, you know, survivable. I would figure for a game that makes as much as Call of Duty does, especially Warzone, there would be a way to somehow allocate those funds both to enough workers that you could keep all of your QA testers still working and maybe even pay them a little more. I think that these companies have kind of this weird labor practice where they have contractors, but they will promise them that they'll hire them to full time and then lay them off after six months so they don't have to give them benefits. And then they'll tell you, oh, come back next year and you know work again. So they almost have permanent temporary I think in gaming alone, a lot of women don't feel like they belong in the space. And it kind of, in you know working in video games, it kind of manifests there as well. There's a lot of misogyny and there's a lot of sexual harassment, discrimination. The people that are the power and the higher ups there, they can utilize contractors because they will do anything to try to get hired. And I feel like that puts you know marginalized people in a bad position to be abused. And that's where you see a lot of those things. They want a job, they want to work in their dream job, and that gets kind of taken advantage of. What caused the Raven software strike in December was the uh, letting go of 12 of our associates. Uh, in QA. All in good standing, they had committed no fireable offense and their performance was fine. Probably one of the worst experiences I've ever had working at a company like that was this like constant palpable feel of fear around the room that like you would be next on the chopping block. Like your head would and it would roll. And in response to that, into what we saw was something completely arbitrary and unfair, uh, we sort of took up arms against it. We had gone to leadership several times 
prior to us unionizing, prior to any of this, asking, hey, you know, here are the changes we'd like to see. How can we open up a dialogue? We'd like to improve things. We'd like to, you know, get things, you know, rolling and just nothing was going through. And the, the letting go of those 12 testers was sort of the final straw for a lot of us, I think. And it proved that they weren't going to open up that dialogue with us. They weren't willing to, to you know, put us at the table. So we are making our own seat at the table. It's been a really long, multi-year, I think, effort to get to this point where, you know, even just 10, 15 years ago, it was not terribly common for workers to be actively talking about conditions in our industry, right? Because we're very passionate about games, see it as a passion to work in the industry, and we're just grateful to be there at all. We're starting to see this tipping point.